In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So we begin the first of eight conferences on this uh, retreat, 22nd of January, 2018, at Dawei Abbey. And uh, the theme, as you know, is Mary, Mother of Priests and Protectress of Our Frailty. So we are here, 15 clergy from uh, all over England and, uh, in fact, Scotland as well. And we are here to spend time in uh, the company of our Blessed Lady, of course, of our Lord, but focusing on uh, the Mother of God. I would like to uh, just give a little disclaimer. These uh, conferences will be uh, recorded and, obviously, uh, there are no typed notes, uh, and so it's more like a, a live meditation so that um, any inaccuracy in style or content would be amended if typed. I say that just for those who may listen to this conference uh, later on. Silence, as I just said, is uh, an essential condition to listen to what God wants to tell us. Uh, each of us is here not only for his own self, but also on behalf of others. If we are uh, in parochial ministry, we are here also on behalf of our parishioners. And uh, I ask several times uh, my parishioners in Warrington to pray for all of us, and I'm sure they do. Father mentioned the, uh, the sisters in Lanhan who pray for us as well, and I'm sure that your good selves also have asked for prayers uh, to make this um, time of retreat really fruitful. So we are here on behalf of other people, um, somehow as ambassadors, also for our fellow clergy in the diocese or religious orders to which we belong, for our bishops or religious superiors, we want to pray for them as well. We are here also on behalf of our family, of our friends and uh, of the church uh, universal. It is important that we spend time uh, with the Lord, with Our Lady, because the closer we get to God and to Our Lady, the better God and Our Lady can reach other souls through us, regardless of our uh, skills or merits, or, but if we just abandon ourselves, surrender ourselves to, uh, to their love, they will be able to reach other people through us. Three concerns I would like to share now. I have preached dozens of retreats and uh, as I was meditating and preparing this one I felt that part of me to some extent dreads it a bit. One reason is practical. When we are on retreat we need to make some efforts. We need to be focused. We need to fight against distractions. We are in a setting which is not our own. We don't have you know, the level of control and initiative which we normally enjoy when we are uh, at home in our parish. And so this uh, is a bit challenging to us. And it is normal that we should, to some extent, dread it. And perhaps we hear that voice, why have I come? <laughs> Thinking, you know, there is that uh, nice TV series, you know, this evening, uh, at the, which I could watch if I were at the presbytery, or there's this or that, or uh, I was invited to go on holiday just this week, and I made that choice at the time I was brave, but now I regret. And uh, so we have all these things, you know, floating in our minds. And this is why, practically, we may uh, be a bit apprehensive. The second consideration or concern is um, for me as I meditated on this topic, uh, Our Lady Mother of Priests and Protectress of Our Frailty, and of course I went through uh, some of the great things uh, written by uh, so many eminent theologians and saints. And uh, we think, well after so many you know, treasures of uh, the doctrine and spirituality of the Church, 
what can we add? Uh, is it not very, very ambitious, very presumptuous? And there is a third concern, which perhaps uh, you will share uh, with me. It is uh, the fear of an increased duty to become saints. The reason is that the more we know and learn and understand, the more we must implement such saving truth. But perhaps we do not feel like making more efforts when things are difficult enough just to be an average clergyman, let alone a saint. And so there might be that voice saying, don't go there. <laughs> if, you, if you meditate on these things, if you realize you know, what is at stake, the value, the splendor, the importance of all these you know, elements in uh, Mariology and the relation to our, our priesthood, you're going to be bound to sort of match the level of under understanding in your own spiritual life, in your priestly ministry. And that's going to be tough. And perhaps you shouldn't try. You should just, you know, keep at the level where you are. So these are the three concerns which uh, you and I perhaps, to some extent, uh, experience. The first one about being in a new setting where uh, we don't have the same freedom as at home. Well, as an answer, I would say it's worth it. And at the bottom of our hearts, we know it. We wouldn't be here otherwise. We've been on retreat before. Life, however long we spend on earth, life is uh, simply packing. Packing for an everlasting holiday with God in heaven. So it can be 60 years of packing or 100 years of packing. Uh, all that we are doing really is just you know, selecting the items we want in the suitcase. Uh, check the weather. Is it a nice warm climate over there where we are going? Or is it cold? Or is it burning fire? <laughs> so we are packing and the time we spend on this retreat is part of it. So the relative constraints of uh, uh, you know, a setting like this are in fact worth investing it because uh, we um, are making provisions and preparing for ourselves a very beautiful time of Holy Day uh, in the presence of the Holy Trinity of Our Lady and the Saints. And this is the way we should look at it. It's an investment which is worth it. The second consideration was uh, that everybody has said everything already about Our Lady and the priesthood. So why do we bother? Well, the fact is, uh, we are the ones alive today. We are the ones to whom God, through his church, through our bishop, has entrusted the care of souls. And at baptism, it started with our own soul. And so we need to make this patrimony ours, and we certainly don't claim that we are going to be original, uh, but we are going to be new in as much as this is us for the first time discovering this or that aspect of revelation and trying to imbibe, trying to digest and to make it part of our lives. Not simply uh, a scholarly knowledge, and in fact that wouldn't be the point, uh, but something which somehow will touch us and improve our understanding of God, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, of the priesthood, and therefore uh, make our priesthood uh, or clerical state for uh, deacons uh, something more, more faithful to what God expects of us. And the third, the fear of an increased duty to become saints. Well, Jesus will help us. Our Lady will help us. The more we rely on them, the more they can guide and empower us. And, as I'm sure we have all experienced, 
when we try and cultivate virtue, sometimes at a cost. Ease and joy follow. And that is the same with an increased knowledge of our faith. I now read as a spiritual sort of summary the collect of a not very well-known Marian feast that's on April the 12th in some places and congregation, the interior life of the Blessed Virgin Mary. I read the collect in English. O God, who didst make the Blessed Virgin Mary surpass all creatures as perfect partaker and image of Christ's interior virtues, grant, we pray, that we may so venerate Mary's interior life as to become through her conformed to Christ and through him perfectly united to thee. Through the same, our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, who liveth and reigneth, etc. So we really focus uh, at the beginning on that interior life of uh, our Blessed Lady. This is where, where it all began, really. The reason why she uh, received this embassy uh, of the angel and was able to say yes to the divine proposal and become the mother of the Savior and then, uh, in, in spirit, the mother of all those who would be saved by uh, the Redeemer, her son, including all of us, is because she was obviously uh, a woman of very deep interior life, uh, keeping uh, in the presence of God day and night. And so we want to go to the source of, if we may say, her secret and, and try and be introduced uh, despite our limitations, because we are not the Immaculate Conception, but uh, introduced uh, to that uh, way of being, which is to be with God all the time. And to see that this ultimately, as the Collect just tells, um, leads us to Christ and then to the Father. During this retreat, we will seek to know better our Blessed Lady. We know that we cannot love what we don't know, so that the uh, strength of the will uh, will be uh, aroused and increased according to how the intellect is uh, illuminated, enlightened by the truth. So we need to know so as to love we will reflect on our Blessed Lady uh, according to her Immaculate Conception, her Divine Motherhood. We will focus on her as Mother of the Sovereign Priest, our Lord Jesus Christ. We will reflect on her as the Seat of Wisdom, in whose contemplation our souls are healed. We will contrast two different types of filiation, filiation according to grace, and that is for us to be sons of Mary, and on the opposite, filiation according to the flesh, the world, and the devil. As our country sadly uh, commemorated the 50th anniversary of the Abortion Act. Uh, this reflection on motherhood will also be the occasion for us to reflect a bit on uh, maternity and unborn life uh, and how God, uh, of all the means uh, at his disposal to come and save us, selected precisely that one. We will reflect on um, Our Lady as a mother who is also the bride, mystically, of Christ. We will see the distinction, therefore, 
and the connection between these two relationships, that is uh, maternal and sponsal. And we will try and see uh, in what extent they may apply to us. We will also look at uh, the examples of men in a close union with our Blessed Lady, Saint Joseph, her uh, spouse, Saint John the Baptist, uh, the precursor of her son, and Saint John the Evangelist, uh, who had the great privilege and grace of uh, taking her um, to him after the death of the Lord. And we begin with the Annunciation itself, which is really uh, the, the climax or the core of uh, the uh, history, privileges, uh, and power of our Blessed Lady. And so I, I read St. Luke's Gospel, 126. At that time, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel, being come in, said unto her, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Who, having heard, was troubled at his saying, and thought with herself what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found grace with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of David his father. And he shall reign in the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How shall this be done, because I know not man? And the angel answering said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. And therefore also the Holy which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she also has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the six months with her that is called barren, because no, no word shall be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be done to me according to thy word. This is the most important moment in the history of, uh, of the material world. Not even mankind only, but the material creation. This is the time when what has been created by God in harmony and sanctity what was lost through the fault of the devil and of our first parents, Adam and Eve, begins to be redeemed. At that moment, in the virginal womb of that young maiden in a remote and really unknown little village in a sort of backyard, you know, colony of the empire, um, we see and we know that the God who created everything and holds uh, galaxies in his hand like uh, grains of sand shrinks himself, so to speak, to the dimensions of uh, a simple cell and uh, becomes incarnate, assuming uh, truly our human nature. This is the Annunciation. Let's try and picture our Blessed Lady, a young girl really, just a young adolescent, probably praying at night, most likely alone. We don't imagine that there would have been witnesses uh, to such an event. 
there can be no doubt that on hearing the proposal from the angel and after having checked uh, his credentials, so to speak, as a queen would uh, to an ambassador, um, and having seen that, unlike the other angel who met the first Eve, that one is truly sent from God. That's Archangel Gabriel and not Lucifer. Then there is no doubt that she was able to connect this event with what she knew of the prophecies about the Messiah to come. In other words, her fiat, her yes, was fully informed. What she committed to was in full knowledge. There will be no surprise. Not that she knew, obviously, every detail and not even every stage of what would occur, but she knew enough through the prophets, through uh, the suffering servant of Isaiah uh, and, and so many other you know, uh, more or less precise uh, announcements of the Messiah to come. She knew that uh, it would be uh, difficult. She knew that the impact would be universal that the Messiah was not coming only for uh, the people of Israel, but indeed for every nation. She knew that she was to accompany and support him in his mission. Some theologians say that she was even disclosed, uh, you know, her very role as the new Eve, we don't know. What is certain is that her yes was supremely free, more free than any assent any human creature ever gave. And this means that she must have had knowledge, all and every knowledge sufficient to say yes freely. We can therefore uh, deduce that she did not need to wait for the old man Simeon at the temple to announce to her the sword of anguish which would pierce her heart. She knew it already. And that makes, of course, her acceptance even more meritorious and generous. She embraces at once and completely and in details and in totality, the plan of God for the redemption of the whole world. She knows that uh, that son of hers, Jesus, is coming for one thing, one thing only, and that is to save, save all men from uh, spiritual death through sin. And that is why he is given that name, Jesus, God saves from what? From sin. And so in, in her heart, she understands that he is only coming as the head, as the head of a people, of a body. When she says yes, to the angel to become the mother of Christ, she also says yes to becoming the mother of all those who will belong to Christ. And that's my conclusion this evening. She sees us. On the day or night of the Annunciation, she sees the 15 clergy here at Dawei Abbey in 2018. Most likely she doesn't see us, I mean, literally and individually, but she knows, she knows that there is going to be a, a huge, a huge amount of human beings who will be saved by her son. And therefore she directs immediately all the love of her heart, supremely increased by all the treasures of graces which she has already received. And she directs that like a, like, a, like a beam, if you want, of light towards 
whichever human creature uh, God will create in the future or has created in the past. And so her heart or her soul becomes like a, like a mirror, if you want, reflecting in every direction the radiance of the sun uh, and going across you know, the boundaries of space and time. So we can literally uh, say and be sure that uh, there is already a relationship at the moment of the fiat in the Annunciation, the 12-year-old little uh, woman there in that room, and us here. She said yes for us, for our salvation. Let us meditate uh, on this uh, this evening and uh, commit ourselves with all our heart to uh, the intercession of our Blessed Lady and entrust to her this retreat and ask her to obtain from God for us all the blessings that he intends to bestow upon us.